Our presenter this week is Dave Taylor. Dave Taylor is a product manager at HVAC Solutions, which is one of our divisions here at TEC. Uh, he handles a lot of uh, different products, but most specifically related to today, he handles some of our indoor air quality products that we use in uh, large commercial applications. Uh, so secure air, uh, GPS, and those types of products. Um, so he'll be our presenter for today. Uh, in a former life, he was also a, a trainer for Carrier, so he does have that experience with him as well. Um, with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Dave and let him go ahead and uh, start presenting IEQ for Hospitals and Specialty Applications. Thank you, Ryan. That was a very nice intro. Very nice. Uh, today's webinar is being recorded, uh, so if uh, you want to uh, send the link, because the link will be sent to people who have attended and registered, if you want to send it to a co-worker and uh, they can review it or they can watch it, they're welcome to do that. And I'd just like to state there are many other uh, recorded webinars on uh, tecmungo.com forward slash training. So I would encourage you to go see the many recorded webinars that we have every Monday. Uh, they're very good. Some are product focused. Some are not product focused. So uh, there's a wealth of knowledge out there for you on the TEC Mungo site. Um, every once in a while, I will be checking questions. So if you hear a pause. Uh, you know, type your questions into the question box, and I will be uh, checking the questions. Uh, if we can't answer you uh, right away, we will be sure and get you an answer. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to start things. Uh, IAQ is not something new. Kind of a rhetorical question. Does anybody know who or what culture was the first one to invent central heating systems? and thus IAQ. Well, if you said the early Koreans, I would give you that. There was some writing about that back in 5000 BC, but the Romans were the first ones to do that. An architect by the name of Cassus Aranta, he was the first one that wrote about central heating systems. He called it hypocost, hypo meaning under, cost meaning burnt or caustic. And you can see in the pictures here that over Underneath this arch on the other side of the arch, they had the fire that they stoked. And hot air came in underneath this road, uh, uh, floor system that uh, uh, was up on blocks. And you can see some mortar or cement there. They actually heated the floor system. So it was really a radiant system. And you can see on the walls, they had this terracotta pipe that would heat the walls. So it was pretty sophisticated. But way there in the back, you can kind of see a register. In the upper picture, in the upper right hand, you can kind of see a register. And what they, uh, say, what they said was that there was a horsehair filter in that register, because a lot of ashes, you can imagine, would come over and dust and things like that. Now, in the writings, it wasn't uh, said what the MERV rating was, but I don't imagine it was more than one or two, because all it would catch is uh, different ashes and things from whatever they were burning. So IAQ is not, not a really a new thing. It was even back in the Romans. Now, what is IAQ? It's really five things. Uh, we'll be covering four of them today. It's the filtration level, or that's the level of uh, particle removal that you can breathe. There's a sanitation level that talks about uh, pathogens, you see bacteria, uh, viruses, and mold. There's VOCs, uh, there's ventilation air, and there's humidity. We won't talk about humidity today, but we're going to cover the particular level of filtration, sanitation, and the VOCs in a little bit more depth, and we're going to talk about some ventilation rates. All right, but these three big players are the particulates, the pathogens, and the v uh, TVOCs, total VOCs. Uh, particulates are non-living, could be dust, pollen, smoke, uh, anything from one thousandth of a micron to one hundred microns. And a micron is one two hundredth the size of a human hair. That's one two hundredth the size of a human hair. So when you get down to 0 0.1 microns, 0 0.01 microns, it's very, very small. Uh, pathogens are living things. Uh, mold, viruses, bacteria, anywhere from 0.1 to 1 microns. And of course, VOCs or odors could be from solids, liquids, cooking, um, 
jet fumes, whatever. So uh, those are out there, and those are generated internal and external. Now, we spent a lot of time making sure we have things in the air handler to filter out these bad guys. But I have a question for you, and it's another rhetorical question. If I was doing this in person, I, I would ask for the answers. But in a cubic foot of air, how many particles are in a cubic foot of air? Well, there's about 20 million particles in a cubic foot of air. That's a lot of particles, and 99% are less than one micron in size. Remember, a micron is one two hundredth the size of a human hair. And the ones that are less than one micron are most dangerous because they travel deeply into our lungs. But the smaller particles, even if you have a HEPA filter, are less likely to be removed by a filter. For this reason, those uh, particles less than one micron only get captured if they're transported to the filter. There are two main transport mechanisms in a space. One is airflow, and one is electromagnetic fields. Particles that are less than one micron and smaller are not affected by airflow, but by electromagnetic forces. Let me repeat that. Particles less than one micron are not affected by airflow. They don't have any mass. You could drop a small half a micron particle in a space and it would just float around. It would probably float about three weeks before it hit the floor. And also, large amounts of fan energy are due to these high static pressures of HEPA filters and everything. So we spend a lot of time and a lot of money to filter out things that are coming back to the air handler, but most of them don't come back. They are resident in the space. Now, this is kind of a, a graphic representation. The ones on the right, larger than one to three microns, they're controlled by airflow. The supply air into the room affects those, and they're brought back through the return air system back to the air handler. But you can see on the left side, probably 90% of them are not controlled by airflow, but controlled by electromagnetic forces. Those magnetic forces are you, they're the TV, uh, everything they have has a magnetic charge. Now the point is, how are we going to get those back to be affected by the uh, air handling unit? Well, there's a couple ways, and we're going to talk about those. But that's the goal, is to get those agglomerated, is a technical term, back to the air handler. Um, the particulates. We're going to talk about the particulates first. This is a broad class of airborne physical matter that exists, uh, discrete grains or particles. And like you said, members are pollen, skin flakes, dust, risk, like I said in a previous slide, because they get deeply into your lungs. Now, some of what they are, you can see that right at the one micron size right here, remember, one micron and less are not affected by airflow. There's quite a bit of things, a lot of bacteria, dust, carbon, tobacco smoke, uh, some insecticidal dust. They're not going to get back to the air handler. Some of the larger ones, you can see uh, uh, 50 microns of the human hair. This is visible to the, electric, to the human eye. And there are some plant spores, bacteria, pollens, and they're controlled by common filters. The smaller ones are high efficiency filters and the electrical precipitators. But remember, you've got to get them back to the filter to be affected. Now here are some pathogens. Here's kind of a scary thought. That green line is the one micron line. Cold virus. All the viruses are down here at the bottom. There are less than 0.01 microns, measles, smallpox, tuberculosis. As you get to the one micron, you get to anthrax. We're OK. Anthrax will get back to the main air handling unit to be filtered out. Typhoid fever, yeah, no problem. 
but everything under the one micron line is not going to get back to that air handler. Now, sneezes, there's some new research with sneezes. Uh, it was thought that sneezes stayed in a small three to six foot area, but that's not true. New research by MIT, their particle study in 2013, said that a uh, size of a particle size of 10 micron travels 200 times further than estimated. And 50 microns will be the one that reaches the air duct. So again, we're spending a lot of money with filtration systems, but we're not attacking things in the space. Now a question for you, another rhetorical question. Does ASHRAE have any kind of standards for hospitals, patient rooms, surgery centers, whatever, as far as particulates? Well, the answer is no. My question is why? Because they have standards for clean rooms where they manufacture computer chips and other things, but ASHRAE doesn't have any standards for something that revolves around the health of people. Now, a couple more interesting facts. If you do work in the hospital industry, uh, you may be aware of these facts. But uh, four out of 10 top chronic illnesses are respiratory. Uh, the Center for Disease Control estimates that there are 2 million nosocomial, that's hospital-acquired infections, per year. One in 25 people will, uh, will acquire an HAI. One in nine will die from it. 20 to $40 billion in annual health costs. Back in 2009, Medicare said that any hospital-acquired infections, they do not cover. And a lot of these airborne, a lot of these sources are airborne. But remember, a lot of it's in the space, too, on surfaces. When you go into a hotel room, the first thing that they, sh they say to clean is their remote control, because a lot of them are sticking on surfaces. In those airborne cases, 120,000 are pneumonia, and 39,000 people will pass away. So unless you're very, very sick, a hospital is a difficult place to go to. There was just an article in the Chicago Tribune on June 22nd of this year that talked about how the Affordable Health Care Act is going to affect hospitals. They came up with 25 of the worst performing hospitals um, that will lose 1% of their Medicare re reimbursements uh, in 2014. The study was done in 2013. Uh, 761 hospitals nationally could face fines. There are seven in the Chicago area. Now they're redoing that study. They're looking back two years instead of one. So these are potential facing fines. But the fines could add up nationally to $330 million. And in the future, they're going to be instituting some different standards. The hospitals could be losing 5.4% of their Medicare payments. This really catches the attention of a lot of hospitals. Now, the offenders, they ranked them by size, region, ownership type, uh, patient income, and location. Uh, the size, larger hospitals, over 400 beds. Medium size is 100 to 400, and small is less than 100. Large size hospitals uh, were in the top uh, category. More in the west, but very closely followed by the northeast and midwest. Uh, public hospitals under ownership were the majority of ones that had the most of these uh, uh, violators. 54% uh, were teaching, and I kind of found that interesting. But uh, the article said that in teaching hospitals, they're more, they take on the tougher cases. And they are more concerned with solving the problem than they are with cleanliness. Uh, and patient income, uh, low income areas uh, was leading the pack, and urban areas we're leading the pack. So if you have to go to a hospital, try to stay from away from urban, large, public hospitals in the West that do teaching for low-income patients. 
All right, we're going to talk a little bit about VOCs. Uh, you can see they come from any kind of aerosols, from combustion heating, from uh, carbon monoxide, uh, from boiler plants, uh, transportation areas, or even industrial commercial from uh, off-gassing from uh, building products, from furniture, from construction projects. And you can see most of it is from consumer products. And if you've ever been in a, hot or a hotel room, you, you can smell that. Hospitals have you know, cleaning products all over. So those kind of areas are very, very pungent. All right, first poll question. Ryan? All right, here we go. First poll question. I'm going to go ahead and launch it now. The question is, how much will the lowest 25% of hospitals lose in Medicare payments in 2014? 4%, 1%, everything, and nothing. So we'll give it a few seconds here to let everybody get a chance to vote. It's like about 75% of you voted, so we'll give it 10 more seconds here, see if we can get the rest of you to vote, especially if you need the PDH hours, but you're also welcome to vote in any case or answer the question in any case. And we'll close it in three, two, one. All right, let me post up the results here for you. So it's like 69% uh, of the people said it was 1% and 12% said it was 4% and a few of you thought it was all their money and none of their money. All right, so it looks like most folks did a pretty good job and, uh, and got the question correct. All right, all right. thank you, Ryan. All right, thank you, Ryan. We'll talk a little bit about existing technologies that have been around for oh, many decades. Uh, UV lights, media filters, carbon filters, HEPA filters. Uh, none of these around were in... Dave, do we lose you? Give me a minute, guys, to find out if uh, if Dave just passed out on his desk. Yep, Dave had a problem with the audio. He's going to reconnect right now, so it'll probably be about 30 seconds or so, and we should have him back. I do apologize for that. He has narcolepsy, and he may have just fell asleep, and his head might have hit the keyboard. I'm kidding, obviously. This is the stand-up portion of the entertainment today. Actually, the sit-down portion. But while we're waiting on Dave, I'll mention a few other things. Dave did mention we have a lot of uh, webinars recorded on our website. There's literally several thousands of hours on there. Probably about half of them are ones that we have hosted and recorded, and the other half are just other industry groups. Uh, so we post them all on there. So if you've not been to our site, uh, TEC, Temperature Equipment Corp, TEC, Mungo, M-U-N-G-O, dot com, slash training, you can see all of our live courses on there, and then you can also click on the button up towards, or the link up towards the top, and that'll get you on to all of the, uh, to the, all of the, uh, the recorded ones.
just one attached to my computer, though. Okay. All right. Sorry, everybody. Ryan tells me that I'm live right now. I must have lost audio. So I will continue here. Um, we're going to talk about some existing technologies. Uh, UV lights, media filters, carbon filters, and HEPA filters. Uh, these are going to, this is going to be a review. I'm sure everybody knows about these. UV lights, uh, the UV lights have been around for 50, 60, maybe 100 years. But they need to be maintained. Obviously, they last so maybe uh, 6 to 18 months. So there are replacement costs. There is efficiency reduction at the moment you start them on. Uh, with velocity, they are designed really for about 300 feet per minute. So most air handlers are designed for 500 feet per minute. So there is a velocity reduction there. They do have to be within three to six inches of the surface. Uh, obviously, do clean areas not in direct view. If you have a six or eight row coil, it's uh, the uh, the rays don't get through the fins, so the Efficiency goes way down as you have a larger coil. And even output goes down with higher temperatures. At the higher temperatures, it can be reduced by as much as 25%. And of course, if you don't maintain them, you could have mold going on them. This is a picture of a UV light that's burnt out that has mold going on it. But I'm sure that if you've been in the hospital industry or if you do work for hospitals, you see these quite often. Um, media filters, they're effective to MER-15, but the downsides are they have a higher pressure drop, and they're expensive to replace. You know, these have to be replaced every three to six months. And carbon filters, they're very good at odor removal, but the replacement cost is high, and of course they have the highest pressure drop. And also one of the things is increased airway length. And HEPA filters have the highest efficiency, but the replacement costs are very high, very high pressure drop, and also increased air level. I'm going to check any questions here. Uh, I'm on my computer. I have a question about the sound background. I'm on my computer right now, and um, I cannot adjust the volume for the speaker. The built-in speaker, so it's not very good. Dave, I so suspect I the for that. is probably resolved. It was on it was on my end when we were both talking at the same time. So when I mute myself, the sound problem goes away. So you should be fine. Uh, okay. Thank you, Ryan. All right, let me continue here. Uh, one of the problems, though, with HEPA filters is you can have grow through or flow through. HEPA filters don't kill everything in it. This is actually a downstream picture taken, and that is mold growth in that upper picture. So HEPA filters are very efficient, but they don't kill things in there. Now, this comes in very important as we talk about some of the different technologies we're looking at. And, of course, the other upside is dirty filters are much more efficient. All right, a little bit about the newer technologies that we're investigating. One is called needlepoint bipolar ionization, or cold plasma. And the other one is called particle control technology, or more specifically, particle acceleration control technology or PAT for short. These are some of the new technologies that are coming out in the marketplace that uh, are going to be, I think, being in addition to some of the existing filtration out there because I know that there are certain codes that you have to maintain with existing filtration. But these are the newer technologies that fill things in the space. And we'll talk about those right now. What you as designers have to think about is this. This came out of the ASH rate to 2013 HVA design, design manual. What we're coming up with now is you as engineers have to know about particle physics, microbiology, and medicine. 
because the old technologies just aren't working with the hospital-acquired infections. Particle and aerosols below one micron in size are virtually unaffected by gravity and stay in suspension because of Brownian motion. It says aerosols and sneezes generally affect people within three to six feet or from one of the other slides that I showed before, newer studies have shown that it affects people a lot further. And it's virtually impossible for HPA systems to exert control. So as you as designers should evaluate continually evolving newer filter technologies, especially electrical, ion, and mechanical media. This makes evaluation of new technologies a challenge for project teams and building owners. So that's right from ASHRAE. They're realizing that the old methods aren't working. A little bit about needlepoint bipolar ionization. It uses a cold plasma field. A field is just the plasma field that it uses is 12 electron volts. So what it does is takes water vapor present in all the air, that 12 electron volt field pulls apart the hydrogen and oxygen to create ions. Ions are not stable. They're looking for an, electric, an extra electron or looking to give up an electron. They want to become stable. I call them sticky. So needlepoint bipolar ionization sends these sticky ions down into the space to do their work. But it also controls things in the coil too. Now, that 12 electron volt field, that's very important to remember. Because I get questions about, does it create ozone? Well, if you look under the oxygen row, oxygen has an electron volt potential of 12.07. So that field can't pull apart the O2 to create an ozone molecule, which is O3. Now, this is just some of the three pages that are published. That if you'd like to see it, I can, I can send those to you, or your TEC rep can get those to you. People ask me, does it control methane in a pig barn? Because I do show this some, some of these things to some dealers. And I know it does not control methane. It does not break apart carbon dioxide. That electron volt potential is close to 13. But it does work on a common uh, VOC like ammonia and H3. That's 10.07. So that 12 electron volt field has enough force to pull apart the ions. There's our uh, ammonia molecule. It passes through the electron volt field, or and it breaks it down into uh, the nitrogen and hydrogen components. And those are broken down and reformed into common things in the atmosphere, like O2, H2O, and of course N2, which is what we breathe most of the time. So that's VOCs. What about those, the other one of those three bad guys, the particulates? This could be anything non-living. Very, very small, if you remember that one chart. Smoke particles could be 0.01 microns. What it does is those sticky ions agglomerate the smaller particles, making them larger and more efficient. Either they're dropping to the floor or being large enough where airflow does control them and go back to the space. I have a short two-minute video kind of emphasizes this. I'm going to show it to you right now.
Uh, pretty good demonstration. You could see that the smoke, you couldn't even see through the glass. And when I go out and I do this personal demonstrations, I, I do this personally at the site. So it's quite, uh, quite an impressive demonstration. Uh, the third thing is the pathogens, anything living. What happens here is that these sticky ions go into the space by the thousands and they attach themselves to the pathogen, whether it's in the space, in the air, whether it's airborne, or whether it's on something. And they want to be stable. They're looking for an extra hydrogen atom. So they find it in the DNA cell structure of the pathogen. They go off, form H2O. But if this happens thousands of times, that pathogen is either going to be killed on the surface or airborne or it's going to be too weak when it gets into your system and it's going to die. And we have many, many case studies performed by independent labs with different pathogens in real life applications. Uh, not, uh, not a light shining over a, a petri dish, but in real life applications that um, show how fast in 15, 30 minutes it kills E. coli, MRSA, all different types of pathogens and uh, your TEC rep can get those to you. And I can't show you that live, but I can show you a quick little demonstration. These are two plastic jars with uh, one of the uh, uh, bi uh, needlepoint bipolar ionization, one on the left, a piece of bread and some water. This is day one. And after day 12, you can see the application on the right that's just full of mold, but the one on the left is perfectly clean. The commercial version of it is called the I-bar. Uh, the installation is very simple. It comes from 1 uh, foot to 12 foot. It only takes up 2 inches of airway length. There's absolutely no pressure drop. The best place to mount it is upstream of the coil, which I'll show you in a minute. It's simple maintenance, and also it controls static electricity. So if you have some uh, server room applications where you need to control uh, static electricity, you can do that. And this creates a little bit differently I, uh, the, uh, the uh, plasma field. It comes down. Here, here's a good application. You can see this one in the rooftop unit. You can see the filter right here. It mounts with just little angle brackets that come right over here, that come with the unit. And the ion field goes down over the coil. So it shoots down over the coil. This is the power pack that attaches to the unit. And uh, the, like I said, the insulation is very, very simple comes in uh, one, uh, 120 and 208 volts. Uh, up on top, you select the voltage selector. There's a little voltage selector. There's an on-off switch right there. Here it's plugged into a little convenience outlet. You can cut off the plug. It's got a three-prong three -prong plug on it. If you have to hardwire it, you just cut off that plug and hardwire it. So very simple. Sometimes on tall coils, you may need two, one on top of the other, or if you have two-coil application, uh, with the drain pan, we recommend two, one on top of the other. Kind of like this one right here. This has two eye bars, one here and one down here. It is upstream of the coil. In this one, you can see that the coil is clean. This is Valencia College. There was zero, zero bacteria, zero fungi. Throughout the entire depth of the coil, which your UV light won't do, and the VOCs indoor were less than the VOCs outdoor. Uh, the product line is carried by Global Plasma Solutions, GPS for short. They have a 2400 version, 2400 meaning CFM, so it's about six tons. Uh, this is more of a residential one here on top, although you can put up to four. So if you have some smaller rooftops, 15, 20 ton rooftops, it's great. Easy installation, 
uh, one screw and a couple of wires that you wire into a common and a hot. No maintenance. It lasts longer than you install and it's low cost. Um, the GPS 1200, that's one that's more designed for an in-room like a fan coil or a cabinet unit heater. Anything with a fan because this does take airflow, does need airflow to disperse the ions into the space. <clears throat> I uh, read lots of articles from hospitals that uh, buy these uh, devices that are $100,000, $125,000 that they bring into a room with the UV light that pops up, disinfects the room, they bring in a new patient, and all that stuff gets back in. There's no way to disinfect it while the patient's there. This will disinfect it while the patient's there. Uh, a larger one, the RN. Also handle 2400 CFM. They do have a 3200 CFM model, but this has longer probes. You can see the longer probes here. Those are three-inch probes, and those are meant for lap lined or wrapped up. You can put those downstream of the coil to provide a booster charge. It does have some BAS contacts, and it is waterproof. I get a lot of questions from engineers who have, uh, you know, uh, commercial uh, humidifiers in the ductwork, and they say, "Can I put this down the ductwork?" Absolutely. Uh, and then there's the I-bar. Uh, you can see that we just talked about. And there's no pressure drop, and it's about half an amp at 60 watts. So not a whole lot of uh, amp drop. Some unique applications. They, uh, the Phoenix Airport, uh, they put them in there to keep their coils clean, control fumes uh, from the jets, obviously, and they put this in the, uh, the terminals. Uh, pathogens, obviously, many, many bad things, MRSA, SARS, comes through the airports. Uh, so we have case studies, if you'd like to see case studies, uh, for the Phoenix airport. We've actually spoken to the people who uh, have it, had it there, and that they will provide, we have testimonials, too. Uh, gun firing ranges, uh, obviously, with a gun firing range, you have to have it designed correctly. You have to have laminar flow at 75 feet a minute to exhaust the air, the exhaust that um, lead, sulfur dioxide, all the things that are created in the combustion range. But the point is you can reduce the outside air. It doesn't have to be 100% outside air. You can reduce the outside air and save a lot of costs with that way. And also those ions will reduce the particulates in the space because even with the exhaust air, you still have a lot of particulates here where people are firing the guns. Uh, casinos, obviously casinos, a lot of smoke. Um, again, you can have many things back. You get the, uh, the uh, air handler, but if uh, the smoke particles don't get back to the air handler, it's not going to help. The ions agglomerate the smoke particles, and that makes them larger, and it will get back to the filter. Also, money rooms. It's quite, in, it's quite unique that money rooms, there's a lot of cash obviously going through casinos, and money rooms, when they, they uh, sort it and they put it back together, throw off a lot of particulates. So those particulates need to be removed from the space. Uh, this hospital down in, uh, Methodist Hospital down in Houston, Texas, um, you can see where the generators are located. You can see where the uh, outdoor intake to the surgery center was. Um, they had a lot of problems with the surgical centers having to be shut down. And I can hear a lot of snickering out there. How did this ever get designed this way? I don't have the answer to that question. But they actually installed some eye bars and they took some tests actually with VOC meters and the sniff test and it was reduced substantially. They had uh, jet fumes, not jet fumes, uh, the diesel generator fumes coming in when they tested it out. So they were testing this out, uh, the diesels out at 3 o'clock on Saturday morning, which is very inconvenient for them and their hospital staff. So as you can see in the test results, the red area is when they tested it with the I-bars. The blue area is with the I-bars. So you can see it was reduced by quite a bit. Uh, high right condo building, we have these in a Lakeshore Drive condo building. They had dust issues blocking the view of Lake Michigan, and they purchased 80 of these units. All right, Ryan, poll question number two. All right, Dave. Um, while I'm doing that, 
Go ahead and look at the uh, audience questions. There may be a couple on there I think you might want to answer. All right, poll question number two, launching now. How does needlepoint bipolar ionization affect pathogens? Removes hydrogen atom from cell structure, suffocates them, messes with their DNA, or my personal favorite, Chuck Norris style beatdown. Looks like about three quarters of the people have answered, so we'll give another five seconds for any stragglers. Three, two, one. I'm going to go ahead and close it. And we'll share the results with you guys. You guys did really good on that one. Uh, you are correct. Uh, the, uh, the needlepoint bipolar ionization removes the hydrogen atom from the cell structure, and then that hydrogen atom wants to attract itself to other uh, molecular structures and hence neutralize them. So the first choice was correct. 85% of you guys got that right. And I'll turn it back over to Dave. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, you're right, there are a couple questions. Let me get to some of these here. Uh, one with a lost audio. I hope the audio is back. Okay. Uh, question was, can these be installed at the factory? Um, the I-bars, uh, yes. If it's a custom manufacturer, the I-bars can be installed in the factory. Um, if it's a carrier unit, uh, that would increase lead time. Uh, if it's a rooftop unit, you're probably not going to gain anything from it. The, the cost to increase those in a rooftop is probably higher than what anybody would want to pay because carrier, train, York, they all have factory app applications. They want to move stuff down the assembly line. so. It'd be quicker to do those out in the field than at the factory, but um, for a custom manufacturer, yes, that would be okay. Uh, let's see. Somebody talks about the smoke test. They ask, or they make the comment that uh, in an actual room, are they the size <laughs> of a refrigerator? Uh, no, no. The uh, smoke test, uh, because there was no airflow, we do the smoke test in a small jar just to show you the, the capabilities of it. Remember, in a, an actual application, if you have an I-bar or in a home application, if you have the GPS 2400, that ion field is carried down through the ductwork to the room, and thousands of ions every minute are in the room to be sticky and take away the smoke particles. So that answers that question. Actually, I proved that out with a, a uh, poker party one time. Uh, it, uh, it eliminated the smoke the next day. And also, uh, I have several cats, and you can't smell anything in the house. And I have litter boxes all over the place. So personal testimonials aside, uh, you wouldn't need one the size of a refrigerator for an actual room. Let me see. Uh, it says, does the technology ionize the water in the air? Uh, no, no. It has to pass over the, uh, in the plasma field to be ionized. Uh, question about what's the difference between the GPS 2400 and the I-bar? It was um, difficult to see. The GPS 2400, the smaller one, has two needle points. You kind of saw that in one of the pictures. The I-bar is longer, and it has those little points they're uh, stainless steel points. They're about an inch apart. So on a long eye bar and a foot, there's obviously 12 of them. Uh, but it's still needle point bipolar ionization because those two poles, they're plus and minus 3,000 volts. So a potential of 6,000 volts. And the plus and the minus, the positive and negative ions, differentiate it from all those other ionizers out there that you see on the Internet. Those create negative ions and that has the ozone smell. All right. 
The expense, it really, t it really is, is, is tough to say. We have to, the eye bar is tough because you can go from one foot, you can go from 12 feet. So you really have to know how big your air handler is. Um, the 2400, uh, call your TEC rep uh, for the pricing on that. Uh, that's not very expensive. Uh, the next one is the particle acceleration control technology. This is a little different. This creates neutral particles. And the pack, or the, we call it the collider, uh, is the kind of the basis of this. And what happens is that positive and negative charges are cycled back and forth between those two plates, those sawtooth plates, uh, several thousand cycles uh, a second. So what happens is that the particles that go through there, any particles, smash together, and they agglomerate, and they form larger neutral particles that go out into space. The global plasma solutions technology forms ions that are charged particles. This is neutral particles. This is a picture of the collider. You can see right through the collider. It has virtually no pressure drop. It's like 0 0.05. So, um, and the airway length is about 4 inches. So you can use this by itself. It will send neutral particles down to agglomerate airborne particles. And this does just work on airborne particles. It doesn't draw a whole lot of power. It's about 100 watts per 60 square foot. A little quick video for you. Let's look at a typical office. First we'll have to make the particles larger so we can see them. Most particles, up to 98% of them, will stay in the room because they're influenced by electromagnetic forces. However, the larger particles, influenced by airflow, will get back to the filter. Some of them will get through the filter and enter the pop system where they're brought together and conditioned to go out in the room and collect other particles, gases, and TVOCs, bringing these back to the filter. These will be captured because it's easier to catch a large particle than a smaller one. This process continues until every room becomes a clean room. Oh, okay, hopefully that helped you out a little bit. That's the pack system, the collider as we call it. It also does make filters more efficient. Those agglomerated particles, they come back to the air handler because now they're controlled by airflow. They're bigger than one to two microns. It does make the existing filters more effective. So there they go through the pack system. They get smashed up and they go out into space. And this doesn't differentiate between VOCs, pathogens, particulates. Anything that's small, these large particles smash into and conglomerate and it comes back to the filter. So this is just a couple of things we talked about here. Like I said, it doesn't differentiate between uh, pathogens, particles, or particulates, or VOCs. It brings it all the way back, and it also creates no ozone. Now, in addition to this is the ACS. That's a filtration system, advanced collector system. That's what ACS stands for. We talked about this earlier. Most particles are controlled by magnetic flow. There's your flow through with a HEPA filter that was actually taken by a gentleman who uh, works for uh, Secure Air. Uh, but the ACS system has a capture and deactivation or capture and kill, which these high efficiency filters don't. Now again, they have high pressure drops, which we'll talk about the ACS system and what the air pressure drop is, and there's a premium for air length in today's custom air handling units. And I know in speaking with a lot of engineers, the architects don't give you all the space in the world to put your air handlers. The advanced collection system has uh, MERV ratings of 13 or 15. It has the inactivate technology to kill up to 99% of the biological organism, organisms. And it also has a pressure drop of either 0.18 at the MERV-13 or 0.28 at the MERV-15. 
um, then the particles that do get through the ACS go into the pack and go out in the space to clean up the space. Now you don't have to have the pack. You can have just the ACS or just the pack or the combination of both. You can see a module on the screen. These modules come in as small as one foot by one foot or up to two foot by two foot. And they put several of these modules together on a racking system with power connected right here. Very simple to put in. Here is it in a diagram view. You have the particle charging unit, which I'll go through these three steps in a minute. The collector, which is the filter media itself, and the colliders. So how it works, you have three things. Charging, polarization, and ionization. This is basically how it works. These are the three things. The particle charging unit on the left, the collector, which is the filter media, which does have to be replaced, uh, and the collider on the right. The PCU, it charges the particles coming in. So they go through and they are charged either positively or negatively. There's two charging plates on both sides of the media. You can see this. And what happens is that the media fibers are charged, plus on one side and negative on the other side. As with most media filters, we know that they face load. And face load is bad because it increases the static pressure drop. It's not the new static pressure drop, but it increases the static pressure drop as you go along. So those MERV 16 filters at 0.5 inches might be 1.5 inches as they face load. So these particles coming through that are charged now can collect on either side of the filter media. So the negative particles will go to the positive side and the positive will go to the negative side. So you're fully loading those filter strands. And the ones that do get through go on to the collider. Now, this high voltage charge is 10 kilovolts per inch. That's enough to kill cancer in there. All right? This is the inactivate technology. So it's part media, part inactivate technology. Any pathogen that gets trapped in the collector is deactivated. Putting it all together, particle charging unit, the collector, and the collider. And I did want to point out that even if the power goes down, that media has a MERV 11 performance without power to it. Now a couple unique applications. This one happened to be an area of about 2,000 square feet with a 60 air change per hour. And that's quite a high air change per hour, but you can see that they had about a million particles of 0.3 microns per cubic foot. After about 30 minutes of turning on this pack, and they had a portable one in the unit, or in the space, it got down to about 183,000. So that's quite a reduction. Now you might say that's because of the air changes per hour, and yes, that's only partially true. Because remember, the smaller particles aren't controlled by air uh, movement. So they had a cleanup rate of 81%. So they put it in a room that was much larger, three to four times the size, with a much lower air change rate. And you can see that after about 30 minutes, they had about a 76% cleanup rate. So those neutral particles, smashing into the smaller particles, cleans up what's the airborne particles in the space. They had a Lake Tahoe Surgery Center about hospital-acquired infections. The red line here, the particulates, the red line is without the secure system on. This is with the secure system on. You can see that maybe this, uh, this spike here may have been when they turned on something. Maybe they turned on the air handler and the blue particulates in the space. But this happened to be in the Lake Tahoe Surgery Center. And this uh, second graph had to be TDOCs. And here's a letter by the hospital, and I can tell it's, it's kind of difficult to read. But they said since it's been in there, there's been no hospital-acquired infections. Uh, some more results. This happened to be in the Las Vegas Renaissance Hotel. Cigarette smoke, 0.4 microns, about 450,000. As soon as they turned it on in about, 
so right about here, 26 minutes, there's a cleanup rate of about 74%. So that's smoke particles in the Las Vegas Renaissance Hotel. And of course, the smell test, no cigarette smoke detected by a panel of judges. Uh, this is just some more. This is what happens. You think HEPA filters control everything. Well, the red line, uh, this is the, uh, the uh, particulate level here uh, with the, at the at APS, that's their portable unit off. This is with it on. And remember, these are the particulates after a HEPA filter has been installed. So you can see, even with the HEPA filter on, it controls particles in the space. Uh, Lake Tahoe Fire or Lake Tahoe Surgery Center. They had some very bad uh, uh, fires recently, a couple years ago, and the Lake Tahoe Surgery Center was the only surgery center in the area that can continue operation. The rest of them they had to close down the hospital because the filter system wasn't good enough. All the smoke was coming in from the infiltration and the cracks, and they had to start, shut down everything. So the Lake Tahoe Surgery Center didn't have to shut down. And this is a letter that just that just states that. Uh, lead certification, you know, with lead certification, you have to flush out the VOCs. Uh, what they did is they used three or four portable units, and you can see what happened is that all the contaminants were reduced uh, after these portable uh, units were put in. Uh, and this happened to be the, uh, an IBM facility in the summertime, and uh, you know for uh, two weeks of flushing it, they didn't have to send in all that outside air, so they saved quite a bit of energy. And uh, just so you think that, that this wasn't done by their own personnel, this study was done by Berkeley Analytics. Another uh, facility in uh, a Lake Mich or, I'm sorry, Michigan food plant. Uh, they had some pre-filters and final filters. What they decided to do is put in one pack system, and this is some of the results. On five micron particles and larger with no pack, they put in one pack, and you can see that the MERV 11 filter really jumped up. It's probably a MERV 14 filter. It didn't affect the MERV 14 very much, so they decided, okay, let's put in another pack system and see what happens. Now you can see that the MERV 11 filter jumped up to a MERV 14 and now the MERV-14 filter was much more effective. So that was two in line. And you can put two in line. Now you still do need a pre-filter for this. You want to filter out the insects and the leaves and things like that. So that would be upstream of the PAC system. Uh, the Art Institute of Chicago, they had something called their miniature room. It was musty. There were some diesel fumes from trains that were going right behind the Art Institute. They employed the PAC system and they completely eliminated all those, both the diesel fumes and the musty odors. There's a case study that we have that can, your TEC rep can give that to you. Some other marquee installations, uh, the uh, PAC system, the Art Institute of Chicago, uh, World War I Museum of Kansas City, we talked about the Lake Town Hill Surgery Center, Kansas City, Kansas Central Plant at Stockton, California. The uh, PAC system we already talked about, that's the collider. This uh, portable unit on wheels um, that's the one that they used in the uh, uh, the uh, Art Institute at first before they actually put them in the air handler. And you can see this reduces VOCs, odor, uh, CO2, smoke, anything. Anything that it counters. Uh, it's got a 100 watt power consumption for 60 square feet and that's quite a big, big, uh, big air handler. Very small area length. Even with the whole ACS, even with the whole ACS system, it's only 11 inches. Uh, in 11 inches, you get a MER 15 filter rating, you get a, a collider system, and you get the inactivate technology. The APS 2000 is more of an induct with a fan. Um, here's the ACS system, and also we have a uh, a tester, the air quality monitor that you can test uh, in a space. Oh, and by the way, uh, your talk to your TEC rep would be happy to come out and do uh, individual tests for you at your facility. We have both, uh, so we can do individual live demos. All right, Ryan, uh, I'm just about done. Whole question number three. All right. <clears throat> so I'll let you look at the other uh, audience questions while I do that. 
All right, question number three. What is the clean pressure drop of an ACS 15? That's the MERV 15 uh, version. Quarter of an inch, half inch, three quarters, one inch, or there's no pressure drop at all. So we got about three quarters of you, so I'll give it five more seconds. Three, two, one. All right, put the results up here. Uh, so we stumped a few of you. Most of you got it right. 60% of you said it's about a quarter of an inch. I believe Dave Slide said it was 0.28 inches, so a quarter of an inch is the correct answer. Uh, but we, some of, several of you guys said there was no pressure drop, so that's obviously not correct. But a quarter of an inch is the correct answer. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Uh, just one question here. How long does it take the PAC system to clean the air in the room? Uh, well, in those studies that we showed you, it was about 30 minutes. Um, the personal ones that I've done with the air quality monitor, it takes less than that. If we come into an engineer's office and we have a bunch of people in doing a lunch and learn uh, with a bunch of food odors and uh, you know particulates in the room that have been um, moved around, it could, could take 15 or 20 minutes to clean the room up. And remember, these are neutral particles. And as the room gets cleaner and cleaner, there's less neutral particles that goes into the room. So these are neutral particles. It's not bad for the people in the room. Uh, just a couple more here, just about saving energy. Uh, small ventilation equipment, obviously if you can reduce it, reduce it from 100% outside air to 50 or 30%, you have less supporting steel, electrical and duct requirements. We've already spoken about the less of the uh, airway length and mechanic wounds. We talked about the uh, cost to replace bulbs in the, uh, and of course there's less maintenance too. Now, how does it save outside air? Well, you all know about the ventilation rate procedure uh, required in the city of Chicago. Everybody uses the ventilation, ventilation rate procedure. And that's a CFM for a person uh, for whatever kind of activity that you're doing and it gives you an outside air rate. But you have to be careful. Even that ventilation rate procedure, as you saw up there, ASHRAE claims that you just can't go out and use outside air. You have to take a, a sample of what the outside air is because many times the outside air is worse. And this is a USA Today website that uh, your DECTM can get you the link to, but it will show you, you type in your school name or your city and county or select the state, and it will tell you the exposure to cancer-causing toxins and the exposure to other toxic chemicals. And this one happened to be in Miami-Dade County, and you can see it was about medium to exposure to cancer-causing chemicals, but other toxins, it was pretty much in the worst. In this upper area here, this is for the engineers who show you what the bad chemicals are so you can kind of reduce them down here this is for the lawyers so they can try to stop those bad causing gas carcinogens uh, and also with the ventilation rate procedure this is a study done by the national institute of standards at about five cfm a person you get a lot between 0 and 5 CFM a person, you get a lot of the concentration being reduced. But after about 5 CFM per person, you get less and less reduction for all that outside air at minus 10 or 95 entering into the space, which is why the IAQ procedure might be a better alternative if you can use that. Uh, I'm not going to go through the IAQ procedure. Uh, you probably are aware of how the IAQ procedure work, or works. But uh, there is a spreadsheet that both manufacturers create for this first row up here. Uh, you put in some different things about what type of facility you have, what the activity level is, what the area is, uh, what the maximum occupancy is, and what the ventilation rate effectiveness is. And it calculates using the ventilation rate procedure how many CFM you need. 
I'm putting some things down here. Basically, your desired outside air. And this keys off of uh, 5 CFM uh, per person. It starts at that, although you can put in different ones. And the idea is to get yes here. If you get yeses here, you can use the IAQ procedure. And the International Mechanical Code does allow it down here, with the exception where the registered design professional demonstrates that an engineered ventilation system design will prevent the maximum concentration of contaminants uh, for, uh, for exceeding the attainable rate by the outdoor ventilation method. So it is uh, uh, allowable in the International Mechanical Code. Uh, less, uh, less outdoor air and fan horsepower. We ran a little study here, and this one was with secure air. But typically a MERV 13 filter starts at 0.5, and it goes to about 1.5. And, and after a few months, you've got to change it. The pressure drop goes down, builds up linearly, and you've got to change it. But here, secure air starts at a little bit more than a quarter of an inch and ends at about 0.8 inches and lasts two to three times longer than the standard MERV filters. So all this area here is energy savings. And sometimes you can size a smaller motor horsepower. You can see with secure air, you can have a smaller motor horsepower. But the same thing goes for global plasma solutions too. All right, Ryan, your last poll question and we're out of here. Go have lunch. Let me just check the questions. Uh, last question is, which technology would I recommend more? It really depends on the application. Uh, for maybe new construction where you have a little bit more airway length and you can plan for that ACS and collider technology, that's probably the one I go with. It is a little bit more expensive, but it's in the cost of the bid. If it's an existing application or you're retrofitting something, maybe the I-bar, the GPS I-bar. But it can go in new applications also. It is a little bit less expensive, but obviously the I-bar is not a filter system. The secure air is a filter system. So, Ryan? Yeah, everybody's been uh, answering our final uh, question, gonna... which was what they thought of the presentation. So if you have any other questions to answer for the, uh, for the group, we'll do that, Dave. Um, and if nobody else has any other questions, then I'll go ahead and close this last uh, poll question. And a couple seconds here. And if you have any further questions, you can obviously uh, contact Dave or I, and we'll get you in touch with the correct person who can answer any questions that you might have. Uh, next week's webinar uh, on August 4th is solar thermal water heating. Uh, it is also a PDH webinar for Illinois and Wisconsin PEs. Uh, Louis Menno at our office will be the one conducting that webinar. Uh, so you will receive an email, I think tomorrow afternoon you'll get it, uh, on how to register for that. Um, and if you have any other questions, please do let us know. Thank you very much. And luckily, no one said we sucked. So, yay, we don't suck. Is everybody off or do I have to do that? No, everybody's on. Oh, okay. So they, so the, all of them know that we do not suck, but we're not, we don't rock either, so. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, and close this off, and then you can you can end the webinar, Dave. Thanks, guys. All right, I'll put it on record. I'll record it and link it up.